Hunter, and thank you everyone. Um, again, for those that may not know me, my name is Georgia. However, before I commence, um, I, I mean, came to a new presentation, I'd like to um, present an acknowledgement of country. So as a proud land of woman from the Gomorrah Nation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Cameroon people um, of the Eora Nation, in which this university campus is built upon. I'd like to extend my respects to other Indigenous brothers and sisters who are present here today. Okay, so my thesis topic is capitalising on a positive psychology of Indigenous thriving, identifying Indigenous youth's conceptions of well-being and enabling voice and agency. Today I'm going to talk about the background and significance of my thesis research, the theoretical perspectives which inform my thesis research, the purpose of my thesis research, the methodological approaches, and my thesis research comprises of four studies, and I'll speak about each study's aims and our studies who I've already conducted, and I'll talk about the results, what Indigenous youth do have to say about their well-being more broadly, and my progress and timeline since last year's confirmation of Canada. Okay, so the background of my research. So over decades of government reform and policy and research which has failed to close the gap, uh, education and health gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, it is evident that Indigenous youth wellbeing is a critical social justice issue of our time. Our Indigenous youth, uh, although they represent only 5% of the Australian youth population, are four more times likely to commit suicide compared to non-Indigenous um, Australians, and that's ages 15 to 24. Indigenous youth um, represent over 50% of the youth, Australian youth detention population. Uh, Indigenous youth are 26% compared to 53% of non-Indigenous um, uh, students um, complete a course within nine years. However, this is not the narrative for all Indigenous youth. For Indigenous youth who do have access to education and do uh, end up choosing the higher education pathway, the University of Australia has identified that 92% of Indigenous Australian graduates compared to 87% of non-Indigenous graduates uh, engage in full-time work within four, um, within four months of course completion and actually earn on average $4,000 more in yearly salary. And so this highlights that university education uh, is a powerful game changer and University of Australia has identified that university um, higher education is not just a game changer for Indigenous um, people themselves, but also has a positive impact on Indigenous um, people's families and communities to thrive and flourish. And so my thesis research, I deem Indigenous youth as experts of their own wellbeing, because I believe in the thesis research um, vision is that Indigenous youth voices do matter, as Indigenous youth are the future and emerging leaders of this country. Indigenous youth uh, represent 53% of the Indigenous Australian population and again that is why it's so important that we do capitalise on Indigenous youth voice and agency in research, in particular wellbeing research, as wellbeing is foundation to thriving and this will then have a positive impact on Indigenous youth community to thrive and flourish. The Indigenous and Western theoretical perspectives that inform my research so Indigenous standpoint theory is coined by, coined by Nakata. Nakata talks about the importance of uh, engaging Indigenous um, people and making sure that their voices are, uh, and having agency in research. As historically Indigenous people were denied the right and access to, re, uh, to education. And so it's important that we start engaging more with Indigenous people and their worldviews. Self-determination theory was coined by um, Edward Delcy and Richard Ryan and they've identified three um, universal needs for humans to thrive and flourish, um, so autonomy is one of them, and that talks about individuals need to have agency and control um, over their lives. This is really important and has been highlighted for Indigenous youth to have agency, and that's what I hope that my research does, to give um, voice and agency to Indigenous youth on research that affects them. Relatedness uh, talks about the importance of humans to have a sense of belonging and connection. Past historical uh, interventions uh, that have been thrust upon Indigenous people um, haven't, haven't uh, allowed Indigenous people worldviews and haven't really engaged Indigenous uh, people in research. And so studies too will, will talk a bit more about relatedness. Um, confidence talks about individuals being able to master their own environment, have ability and skills. And I try and attempt to do that by allowing Indigenous youth to have um, the power and to be able to exercise more agency. Self-concept theories. Um, in summary, it's just about how Indigenous individuals perceive themselves, who they are. And so this is um, simplified in my thesis research by looking at how Indigenous youth conceptualise their wellbeing 
and um, how they perceive their well-being. And it's important for not just Indigenous people and youth, but also self-concept theory is being looked at how it can also help enable individuals to thrive and flourish. So the purpose of my thesis research, so study one, I'll be conducting a systematic review identifying uh, what does international research have to say about Indigenous youth voice and agency in higher education and what does international research um, have to say about Indigenous higher education youth's wellbeing. What are the drivers and barriers? What are the strategies that can help cultivate Indigenous youth's wellbeing in higher education? Study two, it's more of a broad perception. I've already conducted the study two um, with 30 Indigenous youth from four higher education institutes last year through focus groups. Uh, just to broadly get an understanding um, what they believe, um, you know, how they just use, how they conce uh, conceptualise their well-being. Study three builds on from study two, and that is to get a more in-depth perception of Indigenous youth and their well-being. And I'll be conducting that in August, September this year with the same uh, Indigenous youth. However, um, with the indi individual semi-structured interviews, which will be on the platforms of team. So I'll be having um, a chat. Uh, and asking each of the 30 Indigenous youth about their well-being. Studies four, like study three, uh, however, getting more in-depth perception of what Indigenous youth believe are the strategies and policies they believe will cultivate their well-being. Okay, so my methodological approaches. So this, my thesis research is qualitative, uh, and studies two, the focus groups as the research method, and studies three and four, a semi-structured online individual interviews. Okay, so yarning methodology is another method I've used. So yarning in um, traditionally in Aboriginal culture and today just means generally having a conversation. And so traditionally yarning has been a way of um, transmitting stories, it's a way of storytelling and transmitting knowledge. Uh, and yarning methodology encourages researchers to establish a respectful, open, uh, trustful, uh, trustful research relationship with the participants. And so I practice this uh, through one of the processes which is called social yarning. And so what social yarning just means is before you, you know, have a chat um, with your participants or with the youth, just have a conversation not about the research topic, just to develop an open and trustful relationship. And for Indigenous people, relationships are key and have always been really important. Okay, so decolonising methodology is also another method. Um, this was uh, coined by Linda Smith. And Linda Smith talks about how uh, research in the past and to some extent today has been used as a negative weapon to Indigenous people across the globe and, and talks about the importance of engaging Indigenous people, making sure they've got agency and having a say on research and talks about the importance of having voice and agency. And I aim to do that with Indigenous youth, enabling them to uh, define what they we define what they think well-being means to them and have a say about research that affects them. So study one, which is a systematic review uh, on First Nations youth voice and well-being in higher education. So study one, um, summary is just identifying research that looks at Indigenous use voice and agency in higher education and also I'll be identifying and evaluating research that examines our Indigenous youths, um, how they conceptualise well-being, what are the drivers and barriers and what does the literature have to say. And so these are my research questions from study one, which will um, inform when I analyse the journal article. So this is the process. So firstly, I've formulated my research questions so far. I've designed an inclusion and exclusion criteria and come up with the keywords which will help me um, locate the literature. The literature I'll be looking at is within the past 20 years, so 2000, 2020, to see what the literature has to say about Indigenous youths, higher education, well-being. Um, the next step is to register with Campbell Collaboration, just to make sure and see if there hasn't been any other systematic reviews that have done the same topic as mine. And then I'll be searching for some relevant literature on the multiple databases listed there. And backward referencing where I'll go and um, find a really good journal article and then locate other um, references as well as popping onto the uh, databases. Once I've um, identified some really good um, journal articles, then I'll store them in EndNote and then start my abstract screening process through confidence. And then once I've selected the articles based on according to the research questions, myself and another coder will start looking and evaluating. So study two, so identifying more of a broad perception of Indigenous youth's wellbeing. Okay, so this was conducted with focus groups and just 
getting an idea how do Indigenous youth in higher education more broadly conceptualise their wellbeing. Uh, and also identifying the drivers and barriers uh, and also what do youth have to say about um, having a voice of agency in research. Okay, so once I've died, done my data collection, which was last year, I've transcribed, I've done my coding and calculating terrain reliability. And so the coding process I used was born in Clark's um, 2006 six phase process. So firstly, I familiarised myself with the data, I generalised initial codes, and I've searched for the themes, and then once I've identified these, I've reviewed them, and then defined and named them, uh, and then I've just submitted my results chapter, chapter six from mid candidature, and just about to submit my first publication. So these are the data results. So what did Indigenous youth uh, more broadly have to say? Uh, about their well-being. So these were the enablers. Of, this is what Indigenous youth identified as uh, enablers of their well-being. So cultural identity was critical, family and kinship, connection to country, spirituality, sense of self and Indigenous student role models. So Indigenous youth identified that cultural identity was really important for their well-being, uh, knowing their Aboriginality, knowing where they come from and their Torres Strait Islander heritage. Um, some youth did acknowledge for those um, that did, you know, speak language. This is to Australia Islander um, student. Um, he identified that he, you know, cultural fact is really important. The students that didn't, um, due to historic, you know, removal, and it might be urban students acknowledged that although they might speak language or practice culture, their overall identity was really important. Family and kinship was another enabler of Indigenous youth's well-being. Um, However, some students did acknowledge that it could be a barrier to their well-being um, if, they did, if, were, if they were raised in a family violence environment. Um, so that's important to note as well. Connection to country was also a critical enabler um, of Indigenous youth's well-being. Connection to country is more of a subjective concept. So for some Indigenous youth who might not have known where they come from, where their family's from, they identified as their uh, community or what another term for that. Um, has been important, um, but connection to country, like going back to land and where your family from, was also really important, especially when you're studying and you might get really stressed, you know, going back to country would, would help them. This is a photo of my country, uh, so as an insider research member, it's really important that I share with you all um, my country. So this is well known country, um, the Bean Mountain Reserve, so where my grandmother um, grew up before she was removed, and um, this is not far from Dubbo. Spirituality was identified as a really important enabler of Indigenous youth wellbeing. Uh, spirituality, the youth identified as quite a difficult concept to, to explain and to define. However, they did say that they did define spirituality as being connected to yourself, having peace within yourself, and knowing who you are. Identity, this is where the self-concept stuff comes into it. So students, um, separate from the cultural identity, they talked about knowing also the importance of knowing who they are and having confidence with yourself as well. Um, I do predict, do predict sorry, that in studies three and four, um, we start to see more of the self-concept stuff coming through um, because one of the limitations of studies two focus groups was that when the youth responded to some of the questions, I think they responded more in a community mindset rather than their own personal experiences and I kind of felt that, maybe that pressure. And for students that were a little bit shy, um, that they might have you know, held back in their, their views. Uh, so yeah, I think that's something that we'll see in studies three and four. Indigenous student role models. So you've spoke about the importance of having other Indigenous um, older students to look up to and having other Indigenous youth as a support network as well. And that would help their well-being. So this is the model of social and emotional well-being. This model was developed um, by Pat Dudgeon and the Indigenous Psychologists Association. So they identified these domains as critical uh, to Indigenous wellbeing. I showed youth this model to get their perspective to see whether they um, thought that this model did represent their wellbeing, as this is more generalised Indigenous wellbeing, it has no youth perspective. So overall, um, youth did like this model. Um, they liked visually how it was represented and how it acknowledged a bit of more of their culture and how it had more holistic, uh, interconnected um, representation of their well-being. Also showed students the multidimensional model of student well-being. This model was developed by Indigenous and non-Indigenous academics 
um, and for, uh, students from years 4 to 10 who performed really well in their NAPLAN bands. Overall, Indigenous youth did not find this model represented in their wellbeing well, and they said that because it didn't go into too much detail about their cultural wellbeing, and it didn't really represent more of a holistic uh, view. And so overall, um, from studies too, we found that Indigenous higher education use wellbeing is, is, is holistic, it's subjective, it's multidimensional and interconnected. So the aims of study three was to get a more in-depth uh, understanding of how Indigenous youth uh, conceptualise their wellbeing, what are the nature of components, and what are the neighbours and barriers of their wellbeing for individual uh, semi-structured interviews. Like study three, study four um, was to get a uh, more in-depth understanding of what Indigenous youth believe, what are the strategies and the policies that they believe that will help cultivate their wellbeing. And this is where decolonising methodology also comes into it. It enables Indigenous youth to define what wellbeing means to them, but also to come up with some strategies they think that the university could also help with enhancing their wellbeing as well. And it's also allowing Indigenous youth to exercise their own agency too in research. Okay, this is more visual representation. Okay, so my um, progress since last year's confirmation of candidature, so this is just again a chart and um, all the squares in the green is so far what I've um, completed, my completed milestones, um, and then the yellow is what I aim to achieve. Uh, this year um, I aim for August, September to collect data uh, and also um, type up chapter one, introduction, and expand my literature review for chapter two, and chapter three, um, my theoretical perspectives chapter, I aim to write up as well. And also conduct um, studies once, matter review, and search for literature. So this uh, slide is an overall vision and snapshot of what my thesis research aims to achieve, and that is to create a thriving future for Indigenous youth. So firstly, um, I aim to capitalise on the voice and agency of Indigenous youth, identify the enablers, the strategies and barriers of Indigenous youth's wellbeing in higher education, which will then uh, enhance Indigenous youth retention and completion of university and will then um, enable Indigenous youth attending higher education to thrive and flourish, but not also but also having a positive impact on Indigenous youths, um, communities and families to thrive and flourish as well. Thank you.